I think this has been a very tough time for all of us, but it can also be an opportunity where we look within ourselves and say, what lessons can we learn about ourselves and about the world in which we live in? Welcome to At the Heart of It. I'm Nancy Brown, CEO of the American Heart Association. Thank you for joining us for At the Heart of It, where we are exploring the life stories of remarkable people. We're having intimate conversations with our guests about finding purpose, unleashing innovation, and maintaining well being along the way. Imagine having access to the real life fixer that Olivia Pope, the lead character on ABC's Scandal, was based on. Well, you are in luck. Today, I am thrilled to welcome my dear friend, Judy Smith, the crisis strategist and communications advisor whom the Washington Post describes as America's best known corporate fixer. In just a few minutes, we'll learn more about how Judy thinks in a crisis and most importantly, how she manages her own well-being. Known as America's corporate fixer, she's been handling the country's most sensitive and high-profile cases. Meet Judy Smith, a crisis strategist, communications advisor, business counselor, author, TV producer, and mother. She is also the founder of Smith & Company, a strategic advisory firm considered to be one of the top in the world. Judy has worked on high-profile cases such as the prosecution of former Washington, D.C. Mayor Marion Barry, the Los Angeles riots, and the President Clinton scandal involving Monica Lewinsky. Judy was the co-executive producer and inspiration for the character Olivia Pope, featuring Harry Washington on the hit TV series, Scandal. She is also a longtime counselor to companies like Walmart, Amazon, Facebook, and so much more. Judy is the author of Good Self, Bad Self, How to Bounce Back from a Personal Crisis. Although Judy may be known as the fixer in her professional career, she has also had to deal with some crises of her own. In today's episode, you'll get a glimpse of how she manages the ups and downs of life. Judy, welcome. It is so good to see you. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you so much, Nancy. Although I know your life's business is to handle serious issues, let's start with a little bit of fun. I'd love to play a game called This or That. Are you ready? Okay. Working style, early morning or late nights? Both. <laughs> or all around, like never stopping, I know. Multitasker or one thing at a time? Uh, multitasker. Exercise, yoga, aerobics, or running? Uh, top two, top. not running. Okay, there you go. Food, steak, fish, or tofu? Fish. Ah, okay, animal lover, dog person or a cat person? Dog. Okay, me too. And bonus question, wine, red or white? Come on, Nancy, it's got to be red. Red, it's the Heart Association, absolutely. Well, that yes, was great. I like white too, but you know, red goes best with popcorn, I think. <laughs> white too, but yeah. Yeah, red, anything goes good with popcorn. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that was fun, Judy. Let's now really get at the heart of it. I have known you, I remember the day I met you at the ELC dinner, Bernard Tyson introduced us, and I was instantly enamored by you as a person, but also just all you have accomplished. I mean, you have given advice and professional counsel to some of the world's most respected leaders and high profile celebrities. Without naming any names, of course, what's the best piece of advice you have ever given? Um, that's a good question. I think the best piece of advice would be in uh, any situation uh, to tell the truth and have the ability to uh, look at it squarely and, and come to grips with it. And what's the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? The best advice I've ever received probably would be my mom. 
And uh, she always said, be true to yourself. And uh, that's really uh, that's really critical advice. It's such important advice. And it probably fits right in when you think about your unique, very unique talents and skills. You are a problem solver. You know, you have always been a person that helps solve problems for other people. Were you that way as a child or did you learn this as you went through life? And can you give us some examples from when you were young of maybe how you solve some problems? Sure. I mean, it's interesting to ask that question. Um, a, a buddy of mine had called up, right, and uh, asked me to go out and she wanted to get a glass of wine. And I said, look, I can't. I'm sort of struggling with this issue because somebody asked me how I got started in the business. And she reminded me, because I've known her since I was four years old, right, of several points in my life where that really felt organic. When we were seven, there was a big uh, fight in the alley over dodgeball. I wasn't even in the alley, by the way. I was just peering through the window and felt the need to come out and somehow try to regulate the argument and let's all talk about it peacefully. And then um, when I was a little older, probably around 10, I guess, maybe or 11, the playground up the street that used to, we used to go after school where there's a lot of after school activities said that they were going to shut down. And so we're like, oh, well, where are we going to play? What are we going to do? And they said, well, you need to talk to the people that give money. And so we uh, figured out we need to go down to city hall and talk to the money people. So I organized the neighborhood. We all saved up our money got on the bus, which we were not supposed to get on, and uh, went downtown and uh, somebody nice helped us and we got in front and said, we need money for our playground, please help us. And we were walking around in a circle. And um, we got back on the bus and came home. Our parents found out the whole neighborhood, we were all punished, but we got money for our playground. So I, I think for me, just in thinking about all of it, it just really feels um, very uh, authentic and organic that this is, this is a part of me and uh, what I was meant to do. I love it. Now, how old were you when you were doing the playground, saving the playground? 11, 10, 11, somewhere in there, which is why we weren't supposed to be on the bus. But what I did know is very logically when I came from home from school, I didn't want to go in the house and do my homework, right? I wanted to go to the playground because they had after school programs. So I was trying to figure out how do we solve that problem? We solved that problem is that we need to keep this playground open for after school. I love it. So you were a born leader. There's no question about that. And a born problem solver. So that is a great story. So in your work, um, you help advise people, obviously. What is the most essential first step for a public figure who makes a major career-changing mistake? And is it the same for a company as it is for a person? Well, I think it's probably slightly different. And let me tell you why. I think oftentimes if you are you know, a high-profile person in, in the public eye, that sometimes, not all the time, um, people cater to you, right? And, and people become accustomed to that. And I think in a lot of ways, that makes it maybe a little, little harder, a little more difficult to get your arms around what the situation is, uh, what you need to do, understanding that, you know, it may not be, uh, it may not be pleasant. So I think it's 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 probably um, a little bit tougher, uh, I think, yeah. So on the issue of equity for women, let's switch to that. This is a topic that you and I both share a great passion for. And I'd love to know along the way, as a woman in leadership, what kind of challenges have you faced and what do you see as the number one challenge facing women as it relates to equity today? Well, I think demanding it. Right. Um, that is just so critical. Uh, I'll give you an example. We were being considered to be hired by an organization and, you know, they had reached out to us and we did some research on what 
you know, other consultants, what other companies were making. And so we were very prepared for when we met. And we met and we had a conversation with some of the executives and they said, yes, of course, we want to hire you. And I was just oh, so excited about it. And they came back and said, you know, hypothetical that we're thinking about, you know, paying you 10 or 12 grand a month and for two months and we'll just test you basically. Now, what was shocking about that for, for our team is that the research that we had done had clearly showed that the average amount being paid to an organization was 50 or $60,000 a month. And so then the choice becomes, what, what are you going to do? And for me, I thought about it and I really, really wanted to work for this client and I think as, as women, you know, we really want to know what our value is. You want to fight for it and you have to draw boundaries, right? And so I had a conversation, um, you know, with her and just said, look, love to work with you, but I don't think you and I are actually um, aligned on what I think that our services are worth. And that's okay. I just don't think that that's something that I can work for. And so I say, why don't you come back to me and you think about it? Because I said that I don't plan to work for less. And uh, she thought about it and came back and magically, right, that 50 grand was hence available to me now. So I think that that's important. I also think too that I would say we're still in COVID, but, you know, starting to come out of it. I mean, women, it, it's just been really tough, right? There's more women that have left the workforce, uh, more women that are out of work. We had to deal with that um, and child care uh, as well. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a lot, uh, I think, facing us now. Yeah, it's tough. And boy, I love that story because it really shows you have to stand up for yourself. And I think as women, I don't, why is it so hard? I don't know why it's so hard for, for women generally, but you advise new leaders as well. And so if you had to crystallize advice for a, a woman, um, whether they're a newly minted leader or someone established, I heard you say, stand up for yourself, draw your boundaries, know your value. Are there other pieces of advice you would give to a woman leader? Sure. I think for leaders, period, you have to be who you are. You have to be authentic, right? I think a good leader also listens. And uh, a good leader, I think, has a sense of how their employee base is feeling. And I think a good leader is should be very clear about what the organization stands for and what it doesn't and what the parameters are. Yeah. You know, the studies and stories about pay equity of whip, the very few women CEOs of uh, Fortune 500 companies and women leaders in companies in general, those stories are shocking, but you look at the performance of companies led by women and they are incredible. So it's, uh, it's a topic we'll keep, keep focusing on for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, to your point, I think if we just do what we do, and focus on work, I tend to sort of blur out the noise, if that makes sense, right? And just do what you need to do what you need to do. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. So speaking of advice, I loved your book, Good Self, Bad Self. Um, and in that book, you discuss how everyone must learn to live with personal missteps. You know, whether we've put ourselves in awkward situations or we've created a crisis. In your book, you talk about how to resolve issues before they send a person spinning out of control. Tell us about that. You know, tell us the advice you give in the book and what, what drove you to write the book. Well, what drove me to write the book is that I oftentimes see some characteristics that are common that lead to crisis, right? Whether it's denial or ego or insecurity. And I think that when you look at those issues, when you bring them to the table, when you have a problem, it just compounds it, right? If you know that there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, denying that it exists is not helpful. What it just means is that 
by the time that you get to addressing the problem, that it's going to be more uh, complicated and more expansive, honestly, than it than it had to be when you first uh, when you first got to it. I think you want to deal with things head on. Uh, that is the that's the best advice that I can give. Can you think of a time that your own advice has played out in your life? Um, yeah, yeah. I was um, at a point one time when I was um, really thinking about how to grow the company, right? Would I merge? Would I get uh, investors or would I just move forward? And really, I had decided um, just to move forward and just to put one foot before the other. And um, what led me to that, and I would say the advice I gave myself, is that instinctively, Judy, you know what to do, right? You just need to just need to do it. And so I, I, I took my own advice on that. I love it. You know, listening to our inner self always is so important. I think so many times we know exactly what to do and we're looking for affirmation. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, Nancy, just to, to go back to that, just to highlight that point, it's so true, right? People often say that they look to other people for advice and it's it is absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's a that's a good thing. But I do think that if you just sit still, the answer to the issue or the problem or the challenge that you are facing is right there. You know what to do. The question is, do you have the courage to say yes, that this is what I should be doing and do it? But, but the answer is there. It's always there. It's always there. You're, it's so true. I think of all of these things in my life that you might ruminate over, and it's like, go with the first, your first instinct. Your first instinct is always right, but have the courage to step up and do it, and that's the issue. That's right. That yeah. is the issue. You know, so many people depend on you to have the answers, to always be strong, and it must be hard, you know, for your clients and for you to let your guard down a little bit. Um, do you have a time that you could share where you were unsure about how to move forward? And did someone help you, you know, think about working through your crisis? Your, you know, everyone calls Judy when they have something in their life. Who do you call? Honestly, I call myself. I mean, it's sort of based on what we were just saying. Um, I just, you have to take that quiet time. Often for me, the, I do my best thinking when I'm walking. Right. It's just nice and peaceful. And, you know, I know on the show you talk a lot about well-being. And for me, I make sure that I do something for myself. And that is what I choose to do every day. I try to walk um, and try to just have some uh, some peace. Uh, I uh, meditate during the day. I just stop, take some breaths. And so I think those kinds of things are important. They're so important. And, and you know, taking care of ourselves first allows us to be superhuman for other people. And there is no doubt so many people count on you to be superhuman. Now, in terms of your own superpowers, um, what is it that you do? When you get a new client, you're trying to help them um, come to a solution for their problem. How is there a process you go through or is it your own intuition based upon having done this for so many years? all the way back to when you were 11 years old and you were solving problems. Oh, that sounded like a long time now, Nancy. <laughs> we're um, not gonna age ourselves, Judy. No, let's not, let's not, let's, let's not. not. Look, I think intuition is important, but really where I start with problems is what are the facts? What are the issues here? Um, what does the client want to accomplish? What's the sort of uh, objective? But knowing the facts of what the problem is really allows you to analyze it, right? Determining what outcome you want, weighing sort of the pros and cons of the facts, how issues are going to land. And it's very simple, it's not complicated. If you're having a conversation with a person, right? And you got into an argument with them, for example, you're gonna think about, okay, I should probably say this this way right? That person will receive that information in a different way if I use these words. So those are all things 
like we do in everyday life that you apply to work issues as well. Yeah, that's so good. You know, in the Signature Five, and just a minute ago, you talked a little bit about how you take care of yourself, meditation, walking, taking time for yourself. Is there anything that you do for fun? Anything that might surprise people about what you get enjoyment doing? I heard the popcorn earlier. My kids would tell you I'm pretty silly at, at home. Yeah, I'm pretty silly at home. Yeah. No song that you sing at the top of your lungs when no one's listening? Uh, sometimes I sing uh, Rise Up. I sing that. I'm not a good singer, though. I, I have been told many times by people who know me well. <laughs> so let me ask you this. I love your Monday motivation messages on Twitter. Thank you for doing those, first of all. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> they are incredible. So recently you wrote... The truth of the matter is you are more than enough just as you are, and your individuality is what will make you stand out from the pack. Do not try to be someone you're not. Gosh, there's so many lessons in that quote. What prompted you to write it? What were you thinking? Um, and who? what were you hoping people would take away from that? I feel that to my core, right? And I'm, I'm hoping that people would feel that being yourself and being authentic is enough. It's who you are, right? You don't have to be anything different. You don't have to prove anything to anyone that that is sufficient, right? And, it, and as I said in the quote, that it is really, truly more than enough. You are. And I think believing that and having uh, confidence in yourself and your ability is critical to one's success. So I, I would hope that people would feel um, empowered and motivated and to go out and do what they truly know, what they are capable of, yeah. and much more. And much more. It's just very inspirational. Thank you so much. And speaking of inspiration, I know that this past year for you and your business has been all in focused on the coronavirus. I think all of our lives have been all in focused on the coronavirus. How has this impacted you personally? And have you learned anything that would help our viewers and other companies and organizations? Yeah, I mean, for us, we have been partnering with uh, John Hopkins and helping to make sure that the uh, American public and we've worked with corporations and associations have been educated about the virus. I think probably for most of us, being at home has taught us a whole lot of things, right? Um, I think a few things. It has one forced a lot of people to examine where they are in their life. Do they want to be there? Are they really pursuing what their uh, passion is? Are they accomplishing what they want? Uh, are they happy? Um, just the other day, I got a text from, I sent a buddy of mine just to check on her and she sent me a text back. And I said, you know, what have you learned during this period? And she said, I've learned that I'm more resilient than I thought, right? And so I think, this has been a very tough time for, for all of us, but it can also be an opportunity where we look within ourselves and say, what lessons, what lessons can we learn about ourselves and uh, about the world in which we live in? Yeah. So true, boy. I'll tell you, um, you know, I think for so many of us, we were all in at the beginning trying to save companies, solve problems. And then you have this time where you're like, wow, you know, I've never sat still this long. You know, what does this mean? And what, you know, do, am I going to enjoy this moment of sitting still or am I going to be, you know, fearful or anxious? And so it's, it's I, I just love what you say and I can relate to it very personally as well. Oh, it's so true. I was just thinking the other day, when was the last time I've been on a plane? I travel an awful lot. We've got offices in um, D.C., New York, L.A., and we opened up a London office as well. And um, I haven't been on a plane uh, since COVID started. And so it's, it's also taught, I think, all of us uh, a new way of doing business, right? And sort of examining, do we have to do all of that? So, yeah, 
Yes, I for one am happy to not spend as much time on airplanes in the future. And that's something I've reflected on, certainly during this time. Me too, me too. Yeah. So Judy, what has been your proudest accomplishment and what would you like your legacy to be? Well, you know, I have probably a different viewpoint on legacy maybe than most, which is that it's really not something I think about. And I, I tell you why, because I think that you live your legacy every single day. You create it every day. Think about that by what you do and how you live and what you contribute to the world and contribute to others. So to me, every single day is you are building your legacy. That's what that is. Love that. And finally, before we say goodbye, um, can you leave us with something inspirational to hold on to from your heart, a quote, words of encouragement, something that you would like our viewers to take away? I would say, first of all, the most important powers that you have are your thoughts and your action, right? If you really think here that you can do something and it is your intent and you put your actions behind it, that is very, very powerful. The other thing that I always think about is people say a lot of things. And the thing that I uh, admire most are people that actually act on those things. And one of the, one of the people that I'm thinking of that comes to mind is Nelson Mandela. He had um, issues that profoundly affected him and, and things that he stood up for and was not just talking about it, but really said that this means so much to me that I am going to risk it all and put it on the line and was in prison for it. And so it's one thing for us to talk about things that are important to us but it's another to actually act on them. Yes. Boy, now that is a word to the wise. Judy Smith, thank you for the time today. It has been such a delight to learn about you back when you were 11 years old. Thank you for all that you do. Nancy, don't share that with everybody. Don't tell anybody that. Yeah, exactly. I know. Well, it's okay that you were 11. The qu we're just not going to talk about how many years ago that was for either of us because I <laughs> have a feeling we're age contemporaries. But thank you so much, Judy. Thank you so much, Nancy. And I know that everybody knows this, but I love Nancy. The organization does such, such good work. And um, anytime you need me, I'm there. So, so thank you so much for having me. It means a lot to me. Thank you, Judy. We'll see you soon. Take care. Okay. Be All safe. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. I learn so much from Judy every time I talk with her. But in today's discussion, my biggest takeaways really were how she talked about that words and actions really define a person's spirit, um, and that words are not enough, but that actions are what really matter. And I love how Judy talked about that legacy is built every single day. It's not the culmination of a person's life work, but it's what a person does every day that is their legacy. Those are really wonderful words that I know uh, will have an imprint on me for a long time. I'd also like to know what you have taken away from our conversation today. We would love to hear from you. Please subscribe, comment, and share. I'm Nancy Brown. Thank you for joining in. Next on At the Heart of It with Nancy Brown, connecting people, policy, and politics, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty shares her heart, mind, and life after stroke with CEO Nancy Brown. It's easy to find fault is harder to find an answer or resolve. So if you're finding fault with something, think about a suggestion or an answer you can give with it. Discover how Congresswoman Beatty made impactful change in her community next at The Heart of It.